Hello and welcome everyone to the Building Tokenization Solutions for the Enterprise with Low Code Tools on OCI Cloud Coaching Session. My name is Tara Van Cleve and I'm a Marketing Event Manager for the Developer Initiative here at Oracle. Today we're excited to share with you how App Builder accelerates the use of FTs and NFTs in, broad range of use, in a broad range of use cases, including product manufacturing. We'll also discuss our plans to make the use of tokens easy and quick on Hyperledger Fabric. If you have any questions during the webcast, please ask them in the Q&A area and we'll answer them live after the presentation and during. This webcast is being recorded and we'll make it available shortly after the event concludes. Today's cloud coaching session will be presented by Mark Rockmillivit, Senior Director of Blockchain Product Management and Adrian Lehman, Cloud Engineer. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Mark. Presentation mode. So, um... Thanks everybody for joining today. Uh, I'm glad to be here and uh, share with you some of the capabilities and custom examples leveraging tokenization uh, capabilities in Oracle Cloud with Oracle Blockchain Platform. Uh, it's great to have uh, Adrian Lehman with us today who uh, worked on some of the blockchain projects and will share a demo as well of uh, one of the projects that uh, he did using tokenization. Uh, we're going to quickly go through an overview of blockchain tokenization for those of you who might be new to the subject, and then talk about how Oracle blockchain platform provides the capabilities uh, that are built in pretty much uh, to uh, generate uh, tokenization uh, smart contracts or chain code out of the box and use them in a variety of scenarios. And uh, then we'll share some of the customer examples, uh, including a couple of demos. Uh, one that Adrian will run, and then uh, Vala Volanke from my team will uh, show the second one uh, related to uh, essentially use of tokenization for uh, bank backed, bank reserves backed uh, digital currency. And then we'll uh, summarize how we can help customers uh, get started on their blockchain journey. And as uh, Tara mentioned, uh, feel free to post Q and questions on the Q&A tab. Uh, we'll try to respond uh, in real time, and maybe we'll pick a few to uh, voice and respond to live as we go through this. All right. So let's start this. Uh, you know what? What is tokenization? Uh, you know, let's get into a little bit uh, sort of uh, background on this uh, beyond what you might probably been seeing every day around you know uh, digital collectibles or you know sports collectibles out there with NFTs. Obviously, that's Sort of the current, you know, uh, huge focus of tokenization, and a lot of people are becoming familiar with what blockchain provides in tokenization space through those kind of uh, really interesting uh, scenarios uh, that are mostly oriented around collectibles. But tokenization really goes deeper, right? Tokenizing an asset makes it trackable and helps to make it more useful ultimately uh, with uh, all sorts of automation capabilities. Uh, tokens include a lot of data that describes them. So they're self-describing in a sense. They represent some kind of a uh, digital asset or perhaps uh, uh, they represent uh, something about the physical asset. So as a digital twin of a physical asset, right? And they can include attributes and rights and any kind of obligations and rules pertaining to the asset. So, uh, and if you implement, if you're implementing tokens on a, digital ledger technology or blockchain-based system, you can then leverage that to support multi-party uh, operations, multi-party processes like you know, asset exchange and other kind of things that uh, require immutable records the DLT provides. Um, tokens that are based on smart contracts, right? Which, you know, we need to separate out cryptocurrencies and such, which are, which, you know, if you think about the Bitcoin, for example, there is no support for smart contracts there. But in smart contract based tokens, uh, they are programmable. So you have a lot of uh, uh, validation rules and application specific codes that implement state transitions and all of that can be automated in the code itself. Um, from a business perspective, as customers that we have worked with, tokenization helps to affect both the sort of uh, you know, bottom line in terms of process efficiencies and cost savings, fraud reduction, et cetera, as well as the top line by creating opportunity uh, to uh, participate and leverage multi-party processes of various sorts. And I think uh, potentially opening up opportunities for new business models that people can leverage. 
Uh, there is a lot more information that I would recommend highly. If you're interested in enterprise tokenization specifically, uh, take a look at this Forrester report uh, from February of this year, Invent the Future with Asset Tokenization. Very thorough. Uh, there are a number of benefits, of course, for asset tokenization, tracking the digital asset, or if it's a twin, digital twin of a physical asset, right? So you can provide traceability not only across an enterprise, but an entire B2B ecosystem, like a supply chain, for example, or leasing system across multiple parties, or even in the B2C space. Uh, when you tokenize something, you're representing essentially the kind of policies and rules that can be performed on it. And so you can control the operations that various you know, systems can perform on the asset based on a lot of information about the state, agreed rules, who is making the changes in the state, et cetera. Of course, you can transfer ownership. That's one of the, multi, you know, the most obvious multi-party process. We're transferring ownership you know, from uh, one party to another party. Or you can transfer specific rights, maybe not the ownership, but maybe it's AP rights, maybe it's you know, license to use something, et cetera. You can verify ownership history in a provable manner without relying on intermediaries. And also you can allow for fractional ownership of an asset. And this has been one of the more popular uh, use cases, if you will, in order to increase liquidity or enable greater participation. And so the use of, uh, you know, for example, fractional ownership in real estate uh, assets has been a you know, very popular area. Um, you see here some numbers from markets and markets research looking at growth of about 19.5% compound annual growth rate from 1.9 billion uh, in 2020 in tokenization market to 4.8 billion projected for 2025. Now, um, obviously a lot of tokenization is used in cryptocurrencies, but let's look beyond crypto, right? Uh, even though of course, you know, of course, use of tokens was in the Bitcoin blockchain and that was cryptocurrency based and there is a lot of other cryptocurrency chains surrounding, you know, uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum. In Ethereum, we've seen an introduction of programmable tokens based on smart contracts, right? So fungible tokens on ERC-20 and non-fungible tokens on ERC-721, and most recently, ERC-1155, which combines both fungible and non-fungible tokens and takes things to the next level. And there is a number of new networks, like Flow Network, for example, supporting NFT marketplaces for collectibles and digital art and so on. But if you think about the use cases of tokens in an enterprise, they kind of uh, fall into two areas, right? Fungible tokens are often used in loyalty and rewards programs, payments, digital currency, stable coins, central bank digital currency, etc. Non-fungible tokens represent something unique about each object they track, right? So things like parts or ingredients, products, documents, uh, people have been using them to issue event tickets, including an Oracle platform recently, um, intellectual property monetization, rights management, data marketplace, when you're buying and selling, let's say, a data set of some sort, representing that at NFT becoming popular. ESG investments, right? If you're talking about environmentally, social, or you know, governance kind of focused investments, uh, representing the value and representing something unique about that investment as well. Um, now, in Oracle, our blockchain platform is built on the open source project Hyperledger Fabric from the Linux Foundation. And in Hyperledger Fabric, there is no native token support. Uh, unlike some of the other frameworks that have token at the core, uh, Hyperledger Fabric is all about smart contracts. And of course, you can implement an application smart contract uh, that represents a token equivalent to ERC-20 fungible token or ERC-721 non-fungible tokens. And a number of our customers have done that before over the last few years, and that's becoming a common building block for a number of applications. So we decided from an Oracle perspective that we can step up and do a little bit more than just letting customers implement it by themselves. Um, our goal is to really try to provide a standardized ap approach, standardized application chain code available when uh, something that is you know, frequently used right, as a building block. So we use our development, local development tool called Blockchain App Builder uh, to generate the chain codes necessary, the methods necessary for token lifecycle operations like minting, issuing, transfer, burn, et cetera. Those kind of lifecycle operations generate all of that from a specification. Now, we picked a token taxonomy framework which is a particular model from IWA Interwork Alliance uh, as an open source template. Uh, it's a meta model that defines things like the you know, basic classes 
uh, and then instances from those classes based on specific values of the properties. So there is like a template that starts this whole thing. Then you have token classes that uh, fill in the template in different ways, inventory, loyalty, and many others. And then particular instances. So if you're using, you know, a loyalty class, you can create airline points or bank credit card rewards programs, or other things. If it's an inventory class, you can create token for kind of product widget or for battle of oil or many other things like that. It's a classification hierarchy sort of that I pulled from token taxonomy framework. Um, so in our implementation, we use this token taxonomy framework and really made it easy to specify the properties, the behaviors, and then generate the code. But we also optimize the logic in the fabric, hyperledger fabric peer nodes when validating tokenization transactions to make sure that it's really scalable. Our initial implementation that's been available since the summer focuses on providing fungible tokens. And this is a specification template that you can then tweak, uh, customize, and then auto generate the code in the blockchain app builder with performance optimizations and ability to use a sample pre-deployed in our blockchain platform console. And next on our radar is non-fungible tokens, which uh, you know we'll be talking about early next year. Uh, if you look at token taxonomy framework, right, it defines things like a token type base type, which is fungible or non-fungible tokens. Then there is a token unit definition, uh, fractional, whole, or singleton, uh, different value types, representations, a supply specification, whether it's fixed or capped, gated, et cetera, and different template types as well. And in the template, you specify things like behaviors, transferable or not transferable, divisible or indivisible, single tone if there is quantity of one, which is basically what makes token non-fungible, or if it's not single tone, then it's fungible token because you can have quantity X and so on. Uh, and they all and they all basically the same, right? Uh, you know, like a coin in your pocket. Uh, mintable, of course, uh, you're creating, you know, uh, ability to issue new tokens of the class, but there's role support and then ability to burn or take tokens out of circulation and return them back, right? So there's more information and links here if you wanted to go into details on the token taxonomy framework. Now, how do we leverage this actually in Oracle blockchain? So as I mentioned, our blockchain platform based on open source Hyperledger fabric from the Linux Foundation. It's pre-assembled with all of the cloud dependencies that you need so you can very quickly and easily provision it. You go in the cloud and you know, uh, fill in a very you know, a quick provisioning form. Five, 10 minutes later, it's available because it's all pre-assembled. It also interoperates with non-Oracle Hyperledger Fabric nodes from third-party clouds or on-premises. We have our own on-premises copy as well, a version called OBP Enterprise Edition, which runs in the VMware, Oracle VirtualBox or Linux Virtual Machine that you can deploy. And you can, of course, operate them in a hybrid mode. Um, we've built a lot of integration capabilities through an API gateway and uh, uh, event uh, systems that uh, allows you to subscribe to events and then get callbacks to a variety of systems. And you could use it to integrate with various systems out there, whether it's SaaS platforms, Oracle or third party, and on-premises applications using enterprise adapters and Oracle Integration Cloud using straight REST APIs as well, or client SDKs available for a number of languages. Um, we've done a lot of work to strengthen the capabilities, kind of enterprise-grade capabilities to make this production ready out of the box with security, confidentiality, membership governance, um, high availability and resiliency, dynamic scalability, and so on. And then a lot of automation around management configuration, DevOps tasks that uh, you can do through a rich set of APIs, Ansible playbooks, and so on. Um, so we have invested a lot actually over the last three and a half years. The platform first became available in July of 2018 uh, to provide a lot of added value beyond the open source version of Hyperledger Fabric, right? So not only cloud provisioning and deployment and you know, automated redundancy and replication for high availability, managed service with zero downtime patching, identity management integration with IDCS in the cloud and federation support, a lot of extended auditability and security features that we've added as well. Uh, and I mentioned API gateway with event subscription and REST APIs, a management console, a set of development tools that you're going to see in the demo today, blockchain app builder, this tokenization support, um, ability to use a more uh, resilient and scalable performant databases like BerkeleyDB for the key value store inside the platform, the SQL support, in the chain code makes it real easy uh, to run queries uh, and the uh, ability to integrate with Oracle database 
uh, visit data pumps that we provide that allows you to shadow transactions coming into the ledger into a relational model that we call rich history database. And you can then run analytics, visualizations, any kind of data warehousing, et cetera, tasks. Uh, where do you find Oracle blockchain in OCI cloud? So if you go to the cloud, uh, cloud.oracle.com, and you log in, if you have an account or you create one, uh, left top uh, menu bar basically opens up all of the different services. Uh, under developer services, you can find blockchain platform here. You click on that and that brings up a provisioning uh, panel with a few input fields and a create blockchain platform button. Uh, that basically is all you need to provision blockchain platform instance. And when you do that, um, it goes back, it goes away basically and works on pulling together all of the infrastructure resources necessary from OCI, all the fundamental building blocks, the set of uh, Hyperledger Fabric nodes, peer nodes, ordering nodes, membership services, which is a CA, and various containers for building and running chain code. All of that's pre-created and orchestrated. And then add-on components as well, our console, the API gateway, identity management integration, wizards for dynamic scale up, scale up and management and all of the rest. So all of that's built in, all of that's provided as a platform as a service, so BAS blockchain as a service kind of managed service, right? Uh, once you start using the console, uh, and once it's provisioned, you can start using the console. It provides a lot of capabilities around administration, configuration, uh, lifecycle management for smart contracts, ability to deploy, instantiate, approve, all of those things that you need to do with smart contracts, and then a lot of monitoring, troubleshooting, and you see a couple screenshots here of uh, different views from the dashboard, topology view, spear nodes and channels, and so on. Um, as I mentioned, the same is available with our on-premises blockchain platform for customers where they may be running in the industries or maybe in countries where data sovereignty or residency requirements don't allow them to use Oracle Clouds and you can deploy this on-premises on VMware or VirtualBox and so on. Same features, API compatibility and portability of applications are supported. And you can also, of course, create uh, hybrid environments and multi-cloud networks with this as well. We made it real easy to deploy the blockchain out of the box, but also the entire project, if you will, life cycle uh, in terms of integration points, making it really easy to integrate with variety of applications out there, uh, easy to secure with membership management, identity management integration built in, on-chain access control for fine grain knuckles, access control lists, as well as auditing capabilities that's built in, ability to manage and operate this without requiring a PhD in blockchain, with all of the capabilities that you need to operate the environment, including enterprise grade high availability, uh, dynamic patching, integration with analytics that I mentioned. And then finally, as you grow and extend the network, ability to deploy and connect nodes that are running in and out of Oracle Cloud or third party cloud or on premises or even non Oracle nodes from Hyperledger uh, members that uh, provide Hyperledger Fabric nodes as well in heterogeneous way. So all of this infrastructure investment over the last uh, three and a half years really makes it easy for customers. But what we found is that beyond the infrastructure, there is still a bit of a challenge with blockchain applications and particularly the skills necessary to build those applications. So there are two things that we have done. The first one is uh, partnered with a lot of companies that uh, have pre-built industry solutions for many verticals available on our platform. The second thing is we've invested in this low-code development tool called Blockchain App Builder. And this is a tool that allows you to automatically generate smart contracts from a specification. And this is where we've added support for tokens. So there is tokenization built in for fungible tokens. And soon we'll have non-fungible tokens available as well in a few months. And we'll show you exactly what that looks like. Uh, in the Blockchain App Builder, you start with one of two user interfaces. So we have uh, Visual Studio Code extension for uh, GUI work, as well as a lightweight uh, CLI command line interface, uh, if you wanted to do that for CICD automation or as a power user, sometimes you might prefer that. Um, and this is an environment where you basically do your development, test, and deployment lifecycle, scaffolding the project. It can be auto automatically deployed into built in Hyperledger Fabric networks that we provide in the tool for testing and local debugging and deployment and so on. But the really cool thing is this ability to automatically generate smart contracts from specifications. And this is essentially generating uh, the smart contracts or chain codes in TypeScript or Golang. You can choose which language you want to use. 
It's based on the model control and decorator patterns and we automatically generate CRUD methods. So create, read, update, queries, you know, delete, et cetera. And then you can add custom logic, of course, on top of that, if you need to. If you don't, you could use APIs, publish with those CRUD methods directly to process any kind of asset, manage it, update it, delete it, et cetera. But uh, you can also add custom logic for more complex use cases. And uh, you can go back to specification after you've deployed it, touch, update some things, and then it will regenerate and redeploy an update. So very powerful tools here. And the way this works basically is that you start with a specification file in YAML or JSON, and you then generate, you scaffold the project and generate a smart contract from there. Uh, very simple. You can then, as I said, expose it directly, or you could add custom methods and implement additional business logic uh, in there. You can deploy it locally uh, and test it locally. And you have all of these pre-generated methods available to run, or you can deploy it on the Oracle blockchain platform and then test it there. And that you know, means you can test it through the REST APIs as well as through this nifty menu dropdown to pull a function, fill in parameters and test it directly from Visual Studio Code, right, either way. Now, when it comes to token, we have a specific uh, format of a specification file that we would use that defines a token asset type here. You see type token, you will specify the anatomy, whether it's fungible or non-fungible, fractional or whole, specific behaviors, maximum quantity if it's mintable, uh, roles if you're doing role-based security, et cetera. You can add custom properties and custom methods below as well. And this essentially allows you to define custom chain code functions with API signatures that's pre-generated for you if you specify custom methods. And that from here you go on and you uh, create or generate uh, the chain code and then you go in and deploy it and uh, you can start running it. So when we generate it, we generate two levels of things. First, we generate token SDK functions. We support an account by system and can provide basic fundamental behaviors and functionality associated with minting, transferring, et cetera. And then on top of that, we have wrapper functions, 30, over 30 different wrapper functions that manage the entire life cycle from creating the token system, uh, setting up accounts, all of the role-based security as well, and so on. So this is a functionality that's generated in the SDK. And uh, once it's in the SDK, then we generate additional methods and additional functions for token setup and administration here, including accounts and roles, and then token operations, such as minting, transferring, as grow mechanism and burning. So all of those are available in that environment. Uh, and this is a life cycle operations and that you can run for this, right? Uh, this is something that uh, you can then integrate with other applications. You could expose easily through the APIs and you can set up a token system. Uh, to make it even easier than that, we actually took this as a generated sample and incorporated it into our blockchain platform console. So if you go to the console under developer tools, you drop into the samples and you see here fiat money token. And so you can install and instantiate it uh, and uh, run invoke will give you access to the functions like setting up initializing and then invoking uh, functions like minting the tokens, transferring them, et cetera. So if you wanted to play with it, you could play it right from the console even without having to go through the blockchain app builder. And this is the, the functionality if you go click on the invoke menu, that's available. All right, so this is just a quick overview here. Um, let's uh, see if uh, we can quickly go through a few customer examples. Uh, we have a number of production customers on our blockchain platform. Uh, from financial services to traceability, such as, you know, uh, luxury goods like diamonds, to healthcare, intellectual property, fashion, you know, healthcare, education, uh, trading services, uh, country of origin certificates, maritime shipping, uh, extra virgin Italian olive oil provenance, electric vehicle batteries, uh, tracing cobalt and other critical minerals, uh, loyalty programs, etc. And we also have a number of partners that have built solutions in our platform as well. And uh, I'm not going to go through a lot of details here, but you can see wide range of financial services, manufacturing and field services, retail industry, uh, food and agriculture and uh, CPG, logistics, transportation, education, healthcare, media and entertainment and so on. But let's focus on the tokenization use cases specifically. We group them into three sort of categories. 
Uh, the first one is representing uh, rewards programs implemented through the fungible token. So loyalty programs uh, have a project that used rewards for agriculture, supply chain, sustainability to encourage participation. And another one in manufacturing space is providing rewards for data collection from CNC factory machines, computer operated machinery, where there's a lot of data points that people want to share across multiple factories. Uh, this is all kind of rewards programs, loyalty programs type thing, right? So the tokens don't really at attach to anything. They don't have any particular physical you know, value. If you have uh, fungible tokens that actually represent something meaningful, then we're in a second category. And this could be digital currency, of course, uh, or uh, digital twins representing other assets. And digital currency, you know, uh, central bank digital currency, bank bank digital currency, um, as well as things like insurance, back office payments. And uh, this is product tokenization, where we're actually tying a token as a digital twin to represent a physical product moving through supply chain. And these two examples outlined in red as the two demos you're going to see in a minute here. But then we also have non-fungible tokens, right? So, you know, things like data marketplaces, AP rights, uh, ESG, you know, auditability and investing is a good uh, NFT use case. Traditional NFT, of course, collectibles, personalized video, we have a few examples of that. Uh, things like inventory financing, if you can um, uh, create essentially NFTs, you're presenting your inventory, you can then go to digital exchanges and finance those. So there's a variety of different examples here. Um, let's start with a few. So this is uh, Decathlon, which is a sports retailer operating across uh, Europe and US. They have a number of stores and they created a loyalty program where when you buy something in a store, you get loyalty points that then can be traded for lessons and sports club membership and uh, all kinds of activities, tickets and so on. And to encourage people to participate. And, you know, if you're going to buy, let's say, a tennis racket, you might get some points for the lessons with a tennis pro. Um, so very straightforward, but, you know, very useful example. And this is done in real time, right? So you're walking out of the store, you the points already in your account. Uh, unlike traditional loyalty systems where you might need to wait, you know, 30 days or 60 days. Um, this is a project I mentioned uh, with incentive program. So this is agriculture uh, traceability. This was done with uh, palm oil uh, uh, farming in Indonesia, a project under the auspices of the World Bank implemented on Oracle blockchain by Infosys. And so as farmers report the data uh, through a variety of these intermediaries, ultimately to oil mills, uh, oil mills gives them rewards points for participation and for uh, reporting sustainability data. Uh, and those rewards points can be used as a digital wallet uh, to actually trans transfer to cash in a bank account or, you know, to buy stuff in you know, agriculture products that you need, et cetera, for your farm. Um, then we have uh, product content and royalties tracking. And uh, this is a project that uh, Adrian worked on uh, for a company that provides uh, patented fabrics, uh, but they don't manufacture them. They actually start with this master batch chemicals, and then they work with companies in the ecosystems that create fibers and yarns, uh, fabric mills that create fabric, and then garment factories that create actual garments. And ultimately, this goes to the retail brand that sells them over 200 retail brands. And so as products move along, they used to, more, they used to basically run on spreadsheets. And so we created this tokenization solution that allows them to tokenize all of the ingredients and the components and have this ability to track and visualize the entire inventory and shipments from raw materials, intermediate products, final products, calculate the royalties, and then ultimately based on top of that, create a track and trace interface that we're going to see. And this was built on Oracle blockchain platform, leveraging uh, front end Oracle Jet, uh, custom sort of com VM compute here, and then analytics cloud and uh, autonomous database in the back end uh, to create the linkage from this rich history data flowing through and ability to do various visualizations. And you see some examples of those visualizations here, uh, where we have like a you know, product looking like at a jacket, for example, in the sunburst view, where you can then see the individual fabrics that were used in manufacturing and the yarns that went into those fabrics, and then this master batch chemical batches or drums that were used and all of that stuff. You could trace, a, you could do a history trace. You could see a trace of the intermediate products before they got to final products at the product token level and relationships as well as company relationships and company traceability. All of that's enabled by the use of tokens to represent all of these ingredients as it goes through. So let me turn it over to Adrian to take us through the demo here. I'll stop sharing. 
Sure, thanks, Mark. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Okay, so I'm gonna be going over the um, uh, product tokenization use case uh, that Mark just covered. Um, it's essentially a uh, certified product supply chain use case uh, that consists of various partners in the uh, textile materials and manufacturing industry um, that have the ability to um, import uh, their tokenization, their token, their products uh, that are um, uh, basically inter intellectual property. So as we discuss, uh, there's various uh, class uh, partners such as Master Batch Yarns, uh, Fibers, and uh, Fabrics. So for this use case, um, we're gonna be displaying uh, Fabrics, uh, sorry, filament, uh, sorry, Yarns. And what we're doing here is um, um, we're gonna be creating a product token that belongs to a specific partner. Um, and what we'll do is once we create that product token, uh, with uh, specific attributes, some that we can uh, create ourselves manually or some that we can import from other uh, products um, uh, that, are, that are listed in the, uh, the, the blockchain. So in this case, we're gonna be uh, selecting products from um, Brockland Tweed. So here we have the uh, attribute lists and we have a number of data types for these attributes, which are percentage, text, numeric. So essentially we are um, providing the um, the average attributes type to the product token. Um, and when the uh, product is actually created with certain amount of quantities, we, quantities, we can fill these uh, attributes. So here we've created the product uh, that is a yarn and now master batch, um, uh, which we have a producer for, a uh, batch producer um, has a certain quantities already um, uh, in the blockchain. And so what we'll do is we'll be uh, transferring over these quantities uh, to the um, um, to the to the yarn producer, so that we can create uh, the product from the token uh, that we have just um, created. Um, so here uh, we we have our tra track and trace um, functionalities. So what we can do is we can trace product from um, uh, various producers. And in this case, we have batch producer, which is the master batch class, and we have various quantities. Um, listed for various products such as anti-UV agents, YMB, um, and et cetera. So what we wanna do now is we wanna transfer these uh, raw materials over to um, Brooklyn Tweed, which is a, a yarn producer. So we can create the product um, that we had just uh, tokenized. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna send um, anti-UV agents, uh, 50 kilograms from a specific lot. We're going to specify um, the producer receiving these quantities destination and uh, order reference number. So we're gonna be doing this twice, one for anti-UV agents, which we've just sent, as well as um, this white MB product. Um, and then um, once we've done the transfer, we'll go ahead and create the product from these raw materials. So here we're done with the uh, second transfer. So we're now gonna to move to the uh, add product phase where a producer can go ahead and select the product that they've tokenized. Uh, we specify the producer, the class, and the product. We then select the product. We then uh, um, register the quantities that will be created from uh, these ingredients, the ingredients sent by the uh, 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 master batch producer. So here we're selecting the ingredients, uh, the ones that were transferred earlier. So here we add the ingredient and we specify the lot number and the quantities uh, used for the uh, product that will be created. So we'll be doing the same uh, for the uh, second ingredient uh, sent, white MB. Again, we'll specify the quantities and the lot numbers. And once we've done that, uh, we'll go ahead and um, fill any of the additional attributes on the bottom left-hand side. Um, and these are the attributes that were copied over from the uh, other filament yard product. Um, so that way, uh, every product token has a framework for attributes that we can fill and specify for the actual product created. And now we're gonna go back to our track and trace uh, functionality. We're going to um, uh, select um, Let's see, we're gonna select Brooklyn Tweed and check its inventory. 
And we should now see uh, the product that was created, which is the, the, the AAA product uh, that was tokenized earlier. So you see there's quantities of 100 kilograms. And something else so, uh, you'll see is that we have a, um, um, a visualization a feature, which is a blockchain history trace, which records actions um, for products that are transacted or exchanged uh, or created among um, various partners. So typically we'll see actions that consist of registered, produced, and shipped, uh, as well as uh, really a time frame from when those uh, different transactions were made. We also have another visualization, which is product composition, which shows the makeup and breakdown of the AAA product uh, for the uh, basically the raw materials used for that creation of that product. So let's go back and, and go ahead and transfer that product to a uh, fabric producer. So basically the product is gonna repeat itself. And we're gonna be using both a filament yarn and a nylon yarn um, producers to transfer over to the uh, fabric producer. And so what ultimately what you'll see is um, uh, uh, basically as, as we go down the supply chain, we'll see uh, more and more products and we'll see the composition of these products from master batch to yarns, to fabrics, um, to garments, uh, et cetera. So here we're gonna select um, the nylon uh, yarn product. We're gonna tra uh, trans uh, transfer that over to InproCore, which is again, the, um, uh, the uh, fabrics producer, specify the order reference. Transferring over that material. So uh, we, <coughs> So we're gonna verify the actual uh, shipment this time. So previously we were looking at the inventories of each producer, but now we're gonna check the uh, shipment of a specific product uh, to the receiving partner, which is InproCore. So once we do that, we'll have a, a timeline of uh, the product. And so you'll see uh, it's been registered, produced and shipped. Registered meaning it's been tokenized, produced it's actually been um, it created for with specific quantities, and then it's been shipped um, from um, Brooklyn Tweed uh, filament yarn producer to InproCore. So now we're going to um, check the inventory for InproCore to make sure that uh, these uh, materials have been successfully transferred over. Um, so you'll see we have the AAA product and then the nylon yarn VL product as well. So with these ingredients, we're gonna create a new product, a product that's already been tokenized uh, for this demo um, for, you know, for practicality reasons. And uh, what we're gonna do is um, we're gonna go back to add product and we're gonna go ahead and create um, the product we were looking for. So again, process repeats itself. Um, you'll see we selected the product. Uh, we have the additional attributes displayed. And these are uh, attributes that are usually um, defined in uh, a CSV format that our partners can upload, uh, as we saw earlier in the demo. Um, tokenize, basically automatically tokenizing each of the, the products by row for that CSV. So here again, uh, we're specifying the quantities for each of these products. So again, we have filament yarn and nylon yarn. We're going to add those ingredients, specify the lot number uh, and quantity. And then we're going to go ahead and uh, produce. So we'll take a second here to uh, go back to our track and trace uh, functionality. We're going to uh, check in Procore's inventory, and then you should see the product that was created, which is um, a fabric product 24 DSGE, which has the uh, quantities um, uh, specified. So when we click the product composition, you'll see a number of things. We'll see uh, products from um, the master batch ingredients like anti-UV agents, um, 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 white MB, and you'll see products from nylon uh, um, yarn as well as filament yarn. So we really have a detailed uh, product composition uh, for, that, um, for that product itself that includes uh, various metrics like date, quantities, uh, and attributes as well. So it's it's really uh, it's a really powerful visualization that's uh, tracked and traced and recorded in the blockchain as transactions are made 
among partners. So the, the goal is for partners to have that, that real deep um, visibility of, of their products, of their intellectual property as it's being transferred from partners down to the supply chain. And here we're gonna look at an example of a factory garment, um, which is later down in the supply chain when the garment is actually created and we'll see again, a detailed visualization of uh, the product composition that goes, that begins with master batch and then follows it by uh, yarn and fabrics, uh, um, et cetera. And so that, that covers um, the, uh, the supply chain demo for our product tokenization. All right, great. Thanks, Adrian. Great demo. Appreciate it. And uh, great job building out uh, the actual uh, solution here as well. Let me uh, go back and share my uh, screen again here. So uh, a couple other examples here. Uh, we have uh, here a partner of ours called Super Money that's built an insurance back office payment system in the insurance space. Uh, it's not uncommon to have people to have companies operate multiple silos. Uh, they have systems that uh, track payments uh, from uh, payments to the brokers, for example, for certain policies, uh, payments from the customers who buy policies, payments that go to the reinsurer when the policy portfolio is resold to somebody else. And all of these different organizations uh, basically have separate silos that are connecting to the insurance company silos to track the stuff. And so it gets to be very complex. And sometimes a lot of reconciliation goes on across those different systems. Uh, what uh, Supervani created is a secure insurance back office payment systems that uses blockchain to link and unify all of those different silos, not replace them because they all have their specific unique functionality, but to use tokens on a blockchain to represent the different financial flows uh, between the parties across the different silos and provide unified view in what's called border or screens uh, for different participants, depending on their roles that they play. Um, and so uh, this creates ability to uh, acknowledge the receipts on payments as it goes through, show how the uh, you know, policy payments get transferred into the reinsurance company and all of those things. And it also facilitates a lot of real-time updates and reporting. Uh, ability to see the commission rates and everything else. So uh, significant simplification and removes a lot of reconciliation, manual reconciliation borders that happens across silo across you know, in various insurance companies. Um, another example I wanted to highlight and as a partner here is a company called Zua that provides a low code uh, blockchain application development uh, capability and an NFT platform, NFT white label NFT marketplace platform you see here on top of our blockchain ledger, um, we have a number of examples of companies leveraging this, for example, for live event streaming and fan community platform, where they have a rewards program using fungible tokens, but also they provide the ability for participants uh, like headline artists and site members to co-create specific um, you know, events and from their mint NFTs. There's another one which is doing a personalized video uh, that takes, uh, you know, video, professional video from uh, music events or sports events and allows the users to personalize it in some way based on their own participation uh, and then, you know, ability to mint NFTs from that as well. Um, and then things like, you know, news media, for example, uh, that wants to provide the ability for the freelance community of contributors to publish NFTs and so on. And you know, a number of retailers who want to create NFTs representing some of their physical products. Another example is uh, a bank backed digital cash or digital currency. Um, this is an example actually of uh, a particular bank that's operating in a jurisdiction that uses USD cash money, but they're outside of the US. And there are significant handling costs associated. So they're interested in providing a stable coin like token for local transaction but backed by banks actual reserves in fiat currency, which is US dollar. So, uh, you know, this is essentially going to show you a set of permission blockchain nodes that provide a distributed ledger for the banks and payment providers to participate. And then ability for uh, KYC uh, processes that allow senders and receivers to basically participate and get accounts open on this ledger and then be able to 
through a you know uh, payment wallet uh, application to be able to use those tokens uh, to settle transactions and then you know vendors of course let's say uh, can you know uh, burn the tokens to put them back in circulation and get fiat in exchange in their bank account right so they bring certain amount of tokens they get that amount of us dollars in their accounts right as they burn it um, the idea here is to uh, tokenize the you know merchant transactions but at the same time enables the bank to perform uh, kyc you know your customer procedures when they find customer accounts or when they can work uh, tokens back to fiat money to ensure they comply with all of the anti-money laundering regulations. And we're going to show you a quick demo here as it basically will go through the process of creating the token infrastructure using blockchain app builder and then issuing tokens, transferring and redemption. Uh, so we're going to have a bank participating, a retail user and a hotel where the retail users booking and then paying uh, using tokens to pay for the hotel here, right? Uh, so it's Utopian banks that's issuing 500 tokens, uh, retail user balance and transfers 350 to the hotel to pay. Um, and then hotel comes back and burns it, basically transferring it back to the bank so that they have their, uh, you know, um, money back in USD. So what you're going to see is essentially this flow where we are providing the full set of initialization capabilities, account creation. And once that's done, then uh, ability to issue a mint tokens by the bank manager, transfers them to the retail user. Um, and then retail user can transfer the tokens to the hotel uh, and the hotel can burn the tokens to cash out. All right, so let me, let me see, let me do share sound and I'll click on this and you'll see this. Hi. Uh... This is blockchain app builder uh, for Oracle blockchain platform that enables the developers to rapidly test and deploy the chain code uh, for blockchain applications that can be deployed on Oracle blockchain platform or, or you can locally test it using Hyperledge. App builder supports multiple languages, uh, TypeScript and Go programming. And um, there, there is a specific process that you need to use to first develop the spec file to generate the chain code and uh, starting with the, what you're looking at right now bank coin demo is the spec file that we created to generate token bank coin tokens so here are the assets if you're uh, the, for the bank coin demo disc, uh, describing the metadata of the yaml file looking at all the bank coin token asset. If you're looking at the anatomy, this type is called fungible token in this case. There are types of behaviors that can be defined for, for this uh, token type, for, based on the ta token taxonomy, like transferable and burnable are the behaviors that you can define for each token. Similarly, each, um, um, each token can, can be allocated a role, such as minter, burner, or notary. The, there, there are different assets that can be defined, such as merchants or consumers. The token has a specific life cycle of methods that is that are automatically created: create, issue, update, transfer, and burn. So these are the four methods of the token life cycle. These any custom business logic that needs to be generated. Such methods can be written at the bottom, that can be written as custom methods. In this case, that initialize bank coin merchants and transfer bank coin. The blockchain app builder provides you with a simple mechanism to go and create the chain code by using the spec file. You, you can do this by clicking on the chain codes tab on the left hand side corner on the top by adding the button over there and defining the name of the defining the and this is the language that we want to generate the code in. And here is the spec file, which we created in the first step, like bank coin demo in this case, and uh, enable the MVCC optimization and click on create. In this case, what you're trying, what you're seeing at the bottom of the console, which shows the output of code generation as we, as we speak. So you can see the chain code is generated in Golang and you will see once it is completed, you're going to see the chain code that will be shown on your left hand side corner of the uh, of the chain code section on the top 
talk palette. Once you see the, the code is generated, you can go down and click on the source. Here is the model file that has all the data structures, elements of the data structure defined. One is, first one is the bank coin, and also there is merchant um, data structure. So these two are the token, these two are the objects or data structures we are going to use. The business logic like create, update, issue, burn, and transfer um, are defined in this control file that has been generated. Here are the custom methods that are generated with the signature to perform specific uh, custom actions that are needed by the solution or the application. What we're going to do now is to write the logic to uh, for this custom methods. This. So, yeah, just paste it and then we can see that it is there. Now, mm -hmm. I'd already, we already told the customer, that's right. I'm just going to paste it just to. Okay. Once you completed the custom methods, what we're going to do is save the file and start looking at how to deploy this on to the blockchain platform or you can click on the environment and add button and um, define the name of the environment with the with the url provided in your uh, url provided for rest proxy this is the remote url that you're looking at and username has, uh, has been defined as bank admin for deploying the chain code and testing it so we are saying this file to make sure that we get the right connection. You can see that the environment file is saved so that we are ready to deploy the chain code onto this environment. Click on the chain code, deploy that into the environment that we just created on our blockchain platform. Here is the environment that I selected. Channel is stable coin demo, stable coin channel. And initialize the bank, initialize the the token by giving a bank name. Okay. And once you save this, we can start deploying this on a blockchain environment. So you can see that the chain code is deployed on the stablecoin channel and it is there. You can also see the methods that are generated. This is the dashboard of Oracle blockchain platform instance. The health of the, of the instance can be seen at the bottom of the screen. You can see that it is running 100%. There are eight nodes that are running and you can see the channel activity that is happening uh, for the last day. You can also look at the channel activity based on um, for, for the number of hours. And you can see that there's one block that has been deployed in an hour, one transaction happening. You can look at it from the perspective of week two. You can also look at the activity that is happening on the peers, like endorsements that are done um, for a specific set of transactions like you can see the 90 transactions are endorsed and you can see the commits that are performed on the peer are 62. On the top of the it gives you a summary of the number of channels that are on this network with the peers that have been deployed for this participant and the orders that are there. You can also just see the chain codes that are uh, that are written and deployed on on by the participants on the network. You can see there's one participant organization other than what we are seeing as a founder here. And now let's go to the network and see, um, just see what are the, who are the participants. You can clearly see that there is Utopian Bank and Splendid Hotel that are participating in the network to perform, uh, to perform from there. And here is the mind map view of uh, the participants. It clears you a picture of how many orders and peers are deployed for the bank and the uh, how it is connected to another participant called Splendid Hotel in this scenario. Here are the chain codes that have been deployed till today, but today what we did was 
from a blockchain app builder, we deployed a chain code called Bank Coin Chain Code. And here's the first version that has been deployed. You can clearly see that. And you can also see if you want to upgrade it, you can either upgrade it from here or from the blockchain app builder. There are the, here is a chain code that is deployed, I installed on a peer. You can clearly see where the chain code is instantiated. Here is a chain, chain code channel, which is being used to, used to perform transactions. You can see the number of blocks that are deployed on this channel and the transactions contained. This is, you can see the deployment happening with the deploy. And you can see this happened from, from our blockchain app builder. And you can see the arguments that we passed, like Ethiopian Bank and Bank app. Here is a tool that we're going to use to test our API calls. The tool is called Postman. And here are some of the API calls that we created to demonstrate how these API calls can perform transactions on our, on our uh, Oracle blockchain platform. Here is the URL that we are going to use um, for performing the API transactions. So, and here is the body of the um, transaction where we're going to initialize coin token. Let's go and perform an initialized token transaction. So we initialize the token. You can see the token has been created um, with name T1 and the bank coin is the name of the token. ID is T1 and the behaviors that are defined for these are divisible, mintable, transferable, burnable, and the rules are all defined as burner, minter, and notary. You can see the more maximum quantity that uh, that can be authorized for this token is 1,000, 10,000, and uh, it's in US. Let's go and create an account and attach that account to, uh, to that token. So the account we are going to create is we're going to use this. Now let's go and give a role of mentor to that uh, to the to the account. Here is a retail user. Here is the create account for creating an account for the retail user, uh, which is Mark in this case. So let's create an account type by, um, that is tied to the bank. Here is the user ID Mark, and he's been allocated with the TP token ID here. And now let's go and create a hotel manager account. And don't worry about this. This is what he's using for that. But I'm just going to let it. Here's the bank coin merchant details that are going successfully here. I'm going to add a, add a role to the hotel manager to exchange the token for fiat money. Here is the role, here is how you're going to add the role. You can see it's a, it is successful and the role has been allocated to the hotel manager. We're going to issue 500 tokens um, for, for transactional purpose. And you can see that the 500, issue, uh, 500 tokens are issued to the bank manager. Let's go and transfer the tokens to the retail um, retail user. We're going to transfer 500 tokens to Mark. You can see that the bank manager transferred 500 tokens to Mark. Now, once the tokens are the transferred, we can go and look at the transaction history that for the, for the token here. So you can see the balances of, as a, once you go and see the transaction history, you can start from the beginning. Now, first one is minting the token of 500 and it's been issued by issued to the bank manager. Now it is being transferred. You can see it is debited from bank manager and it's been transferred to Mark. Now, for, this is for the bank manager. Now let's go and check it for Mark. You can see he has been credited with 500 tokens. Now let's go and as a retail user, let's go and transfer, uh, let's go and book a hotel, uh, book a hotel for, uh, for $350. So 
Once I book the hotel, there's a $350, which I want to transfer to the hotel manager to book a hotel. And you can see the $350 has been, uh, tokens has been issued to the hotel manager. Okay, let's go into the transaction, hotel manager transaction history and see if the amount has been transferred. You can see that the accredited $350, 350 tokens, sorry. <laughs> now let's go into Hotel Manager and try to see how we can exchange this for a fiat token, a fiat currency in this case. So I'm burning the tokens for the fiat currency by cashing it out. I'm going to say burn. Now you can see that I've successfully burned 100 ID, which, which I, which the hotel manager took out by for the exchange. And now let's go and look at the account history of the hotel manager in this case. You can see you should be having 250, 100 has been burned and 250 is still balanced. So let's see how many blocks have been cre uh, created for the transactions we performed for the API, from the API. You can see the blocks are nine and let's, and the transactions are 94. So where there's an increase of 10 blocks in this case and uh, six transactions so if you can go to the last transaction that we did we are looking at we're burning the tokens of 100 you can clearly see the hotel management burnt 100 tokens in this case this is the here is the transfer of token transactions that we did from mark to the hotel manager here is the transfer tokens and also you can look at the transaction that happened here from Mark, there is a $500 that we took from the Utopian Bank to Mark. So now you can see the last day. Let's go to last hour and see the number of transactions. You can see that the transactions are 10 and the blocks are 11. We can see last, we just had one in the past. Now we can see there are 10 and 11 in this. So now there's an update for blocks and you can also see the number of endorsements for the last hour I went up by 15 and the commits ended at we're, we're up by 10. All right, great. Thanks, Bala, uh, for the demo. So um, I wanted to just uh, wrap up quickly with a couple uh, points here. Um, one is that uh, people have asked uh, if the tokens that are created in Oracle blockchain platform are tokens that can be exchanged with you know, other ledgers, like Ethereum, for example, in the Bitcoins, et cetera. The answer is yes. There is a standard protocol called hash time locked atomic swap procedure. And it essentially allows you know, organizations or users to exchange tokens between different systems. In this case, we have an example, you know, let's say you have you know, a visitor who's coming in with cryptocurrency and they want to uh, buy those tokens, not for US dollars, but they want to buy them for cryptocurrency. So there is this protocol that allows you know, the bank to basically create an escrow uh, to log the fiat money token, send the hash uh, to an Ethereum account of, let's say it's a visitor to you know, the jurisdiction. Um, they can in turn log your C20 coin. Then the bank can claim your C20 coin, release the secret. Uh, the visitor can retrieve this secret uh, and then claim OBP tokens using that, right, from the escrow. So this is a hash time lock atomic swap procedures that's generally used across many different ledgers and can be used with OBP as well. And we actually have a partner solution that simplifies this. If you don't want to build it yourself, you could use Quant's overledger middleware with pre-built capabilities to run uh, this hash time lock uh, procedure. But you can also use overledger for a number of other scenarios beyond the asset ownership swap. You could do it, let's say you could take a blockchain transactions happening on Oracle and do a logging of a hash on the public blockchain or you could do complex orchestrations where you might have some business processes running on one DLT, and maybe then you need to issue a payment on a different DLT as part of the settlement. So there is all of these different capabilities for cross-ledger orchestration and integration that can be done through this. So to summarize, um, you know, we have seen a number of tokenization projects that uh, customers are interested in and partners. Uh, they are hindered sometimes because there is no native token support available in Hyperledger Fabric, and you have to do complex development work. Well, we decided to simplify and help that in three key ways. The first one 
is by enabling low code approach to simple applications, right? Uh, low code is really important to allow people that don't have a, you know, depth of experience in developing blockchain applications to be productive and be able to create things easily and quickly. Uh, second is by providing a token taxonomy framework based fungible tokens, chain code on Hyperledger Fabric and making it configurable and easy to generate from the app builder, uh, automatically generate into the blockchain platform. <coughs> and third is by improving developer productivity, by creating this set of tools, not only for automatically generating the code, but for local deployment, local testing and debugging and so on, which can speed up the development task quite a bit and improve developer productivity. So you have to go back and forth and deploy and test on the cloud in a more complex environment every time. And that's a significant uh, benefit as well. So uh, as a summary, you can see here, we make the enterprise blockchain easy. Uh, it's all pre-assembled. It's managed blockchain as a service infrastructure with a lot of Oracle value adds, such as API gateway, identity management, all of the operations and management tooling. Um, the blockchain app builder for rapid development of blockchain applications, built-in tokenization support with an SDK and full set of APIs that you can easily adapt and publish through declarative specification. Literally can take you, you know, 15 minutes, an hour at most, maybe to create an initial application. And we built a number of optimizations into the Hyperledger Fabric node as well, specifically for tokenization use cases. So uh, just a couple of quick thoughts on how we can help customers start uh, their blockchain journey. Um, we have uh, sort of this model where we can engage with customers uh, throughout the process from initial discovery uh, to talk about understanding their needs and helping them understand blockchain discussion of the use cases relevant to the industry and understanding of the customer specific use cases that might be relevant. Then moving into design thinking workshop uh, to create a design for the blockchain and initial specification for the minimally viable product. And then ultimately through a technical architecture workshop and the work that we can do with our Oracle teams and partners to build that MVP and help you prototype your initial implementation. And this is all can be done in days, as you can see here. So we can take the mystery out of this and we can enable a number of use cases and you can explore them and determine if there is in fact uh, things that you can leverage uh, for your customer, you know, for your business. Uh, it starts with understanding sort of the basic issues that the customer is trying to address. Blockchain is certainly not a solution to all problems as popular as it is. Not everything should be done through blockchain, but we typically go through a set of qualifying questions to determine if there are cross-divisional uh, issues, cross-divisional business processes that might have discrepancies. Is there less than full trust among the participants, among different parties? Is there, in, as intermediaries, maybe that you'd want to eliminate because they charge expensive fees or add risk, etc. Or do you need real-time visibility into multi-party processes or traceability? And that translates into a variety of scenarios that we can help flesh out in those discovery conversations. Uh, I wanted to share this quote from Don Tapscott, uh, who is uh, considered by many to be one of the fathers of enterprise blockchain, if you will. He wrote this very important book, Blockchain Revolution, How the Technology Behind Bitcoin is Changing Money, Business and World, a few years ago, before enterprise tokenization was popular. And what he said was, the future is not something to be predicted, it's something to be achieved. Uh, people were asking him all kinds of things about what will happen with you know, blockchain and tokenization in the future. And what his answer was really is, it's up to you. You can achieve it, you can make it happen. And so you know, from Oracle perspective, we provide a lot of tools and a lot of information and materials to help you do that. You can go to uh, various web pages to learn more about Oracle blockchain, read our blogs, interact with our developer site, or you can subscribe to a 30 day free trial uh, here's a link and you can create an account, provision an instance, deploy the sample chain code that you saw in the developer tools and invoke it and play with it and then see how you can take it further and uh, use it uh, you know, for your business and uh, create some unique value proposition you know, for, uh, for your company. Uh, a lot of additional resources as well, but uh, let me turn it over to uh, Tara here to talk a little bit about Oracle Cloud Coach Clinics. Thank you, Mark, and thank you, Adrian, for the wonderful presentation. Um, now we're a little short on time, so I'll make this very quick, but just wanted to provide um, some brief information on what cloud coaching is and how to request your own cloud coach. So on the next slide, 
Um, if you're experiencing a roadblock that isn't serious enough to warrant a service request, or maybe you just purchased OCI and you're looking for an additional onboarding session, cloud coaching clinics pair you one-on-one -on -one with a cloud engineer to assist you on your cloud journey. So we offer workshops and demos for deeper dives on a particular service. We provide sample code and also provision configuration services. So I'm gonna drop a bunch of links in the chat in just a moment, but on the next slide, we'd also like to invite you to join us to at next month's event as well. So, um, and we also have some other developer events coming up soon. So we also encourage you to share with us any feedback you have on today's session as well, and to get in touch with us directly if you have any questions on how to request the cloud coach or how to get started with Oracle blockchain. Um, and then lastly, we'd like to share with you that Oracle University is now offering free access to OCI training, including free certification exams through the end of this month. So be sure to check that out and get started. So dropping all of those links there now. And then lastly, here's that cloud account link too. So if you wanted to, and um, we will be posting this um, as well on the cloud coaching page and you'll receive an email with the recording. So um, I just wanted to say thank you again to Mark and Adrian for this great presentation. And thank you all for spending your time here with us. Um, and we hope you have a great rest of your day and to see you again next time.